Okay. Uh, so I realize some people are not uh, back on lunch yet, but that should be okay. It's just a very quick introduction to 16S at the beginning, and I'll um, talk a little bit about the uh, what we're going to do for the last. So um, for those of you who uh, didn't hear my very brief introduction at the back of this morning, my name is William. I'm from the BC Public Health Lab. Uh, and also a, a, a clinical assistant professor at UBC. So the dual affiliation sort of allows me to uh, apply both genomics and metagenomics to a more um, public health uh, diagnostic lab setting. Um, so if you have any interest in that, any question about that, feel free to come talk to me about that. So the learning objective for this, uh, this this afternoon is to focus on the, the marker genes, as you already know. And uh, at the end of this module, including the lab, uh, we're hoping that you'll be able to understand and perform marker gene-based uh, microbiome analysis. You'll be able to analyze 16 sRNA marker genes, so that's, the, that's what we'll be focusing on. But the same protocols can be applied to other types of, of marker genes. And uh, we'll use 16S RNA marker genes to profile and to compare microbiomes and select uh, suitable parameters and sort of hopefully demonstrate uh, some, in some cases, what are the parameter of choice uh, and the algorithm of choice when you do marker gene analysis. And we'll also explain the advantage and disadvantage of marker gene based microbiome analysis. Uh, the last Part I'll keep a fairly brief. Um, uh, uh, Morgan tomorrow will go into a little bit more on using PyCross and actually compare uh, marker gene based analysis versus predicted uh, functional gene based uh, based analysis. Uh, you saw this this morning. So uh, my lecture essentially followed this flow. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the wet lab component, extracting DNA, amplifying target uh, primers. Uh, target using uh, primers and then uh, filter out the errors and uh, building an OTU uh, cluster uh, using uh, two of the most popular tools for marker gene analysis. And then we'll talk a little bit about diversity. Um, we won't have too much time to go into that. And again, um, this is sort of to give you a brief introduction, and I know about half of you have experience with 16S already. So the, the hope is that uh, for those who don't have experience, you would um, learn something new. For those who have some experience, you'll share your experience, and you'll, uh, you know, Rob mentioned this morning, your sort of real life experience would be very valuable for other people. And also, this is live recording, so if I say something wrong or something incorrect, it's better that you catch me right now than to, you know, let, uh, to let it slide and it will be wrong perpetually. So let's hope that doesn't happen. So feel free to ask questions. Feel free to stop me anytime if, you, if anything's unclear. Um, so Rob already talked about it this morning that uh, ribosomal RNA genes uh, is the most popular universal phylogenetic markers and it has certain attributes that make it a very uh, popular choice for uh, uh, for your uh, community profiling analysis. The, uh, these include that ribosome RNA is present in all living organisms. Uh, it is conserved because it plays such a critical role in protein translation. And um, as a result of that, the ribosome RNA genes are also relatively uh, it's relatively rare that it's acquired horizontally. There are some documented cases. Actually, Rob and I sort of both studied uh, horizontal gene transfer for our uh, PhD and postdoc, respectively. That's when we actually first met, uh, I guess, over 10 years ago, about 10 years ago. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, there, so horizontal gene transfer also holds sort of a special place in my heart, although I haven't been keeping up as much as Rob has. Uh, and because it's um, fairly uh, conserved, it, it, do, it does behave like a molecular clock, so it's useful for phylogenetic analysis and useful for 
building a universal uh, tree of life, allowing to, you to place um, organisms onto a single tree. Um, and of these, uh, 16S RNA, RNA is the most commonly used uh, for the reason that it, it uh, that Rob mentioned this morning, and it has a good database. It's uh, just about the right size to, to to give you the right phylogen uh, to give you sufficient phylogenetic signals. And so, on. okay. So, uh, given that RNA is well studied, uh, the attributes uh, of the of RNA gene not only make it a good tool for phylogenetic phylogenetic analysis, uh, it's also a useful tool for understanding composition, so microbial community. So we'll talk a little bit about alpha diversity, how you can, uh, the different measurements that you can use to profile a community. Uh, and extrapolating from there, you can also use uh, the same marker for uh, relating one microbial community to another. And, uh, to, uh, and typically this type of comparison is it's called uh, using the beta diversity index to, to compare your communities. Uh, lastly, as we gain more understanding of how the microbiome interact with the host or with an environment, you can actually then use the profile, the microbiome profile, as a readout or as a biomarker for diseases or for a, a, a condition in the environment. So you can actually develop uh, classifiers are used uh, using microbiome information to tell you whether this sample comes from a, a, a particular uh, from, comes from a diseased uh, individual or, or diseased uh, tree for example or this sample comes from a, a healthy sample so um, it allows uh, we can use the entire profile microbiome profile to uh, characterize a condition So 16S, of course, is not the only marker gene used. Uh, and 16S, of course, only apply for uh, prokaryotic organisms. If you have eukaryotic organisms, such as protists or fungi, uh, you would need either the 18S or ITS or some other types of markers. Uh, it, both 18S and ITS uh, have been developed and have reasonably uh, comprehensive database uh, in their typically the choice for eukaryotic organisms. Uh, ITS is especially useful for fungi, not so much for protists. Um, for bacteria, you can, besides 16S, you can also have used the uh, uh, chaperon uh, gene, CPN60. Uh, you, there have been ITS developed also for bacteria um, genomes. And uh, a while back, uh, uh, Groups like Jonathan Eisen's lab propose using RecA genes as a universal marker uh, for the reason that RecA is a single copy gene. And there are other single copy genes where 16S, as Rob mentioned, is a, has multiple copies. And sometimes uh, that sort of confuses the, uh, the analysis when you have multiple copies of, of 16S in a given organism. Uh, for viruses, of course, uh, it's the case where it's very hard to come up with. It's impossible to come up with a universal marker, but there are specific biomarkers for specific families of viruses, such as GP23 for T4-like bacteriophage or RDRP for uh, coronaviruses. Um, anyone else here work with viruses or protists? Any, do you use any other types of marker genes for not yet developed. Okay, yeah. So uh, this, I actually got this list from one of the studies that I'm participating in, which look at the, the watersheds in, in BC, and we essentially profile the um, the water from the, from both contaminated and, and, and pristine sites, and using the different biomarkers to characterize the different fractions of uh, organisms. Uh, and so we have some experience with all these uh, biomarkers in, uh, from our study. So if you have any questions regarding these biomarkers, feel free to come talk to me afterwards. Uh, I wanted to mention that some of these marker genes are more fast, fastly, uh, evolved 
faster, so they're useful for strain level differentiation, where 16S is typically not good for strain level differentiation. Okay, so I'm going to go into a bit about the wet lab uh, component. I'm a bioinformatician as well, so my knowledge of the wet lab component is it's sort of uh, by proxy, I guess, by talking to the uh, technicians, the postdocs, and so on. But I have spent quite a bit of time talking to them, so I'm aware sort of, of the, the challenges and, and differences. So I'll try to highlight some of these uh, for you. Um, so the DNA extraction, it's uh, very early on in, in the human microbiome study. Uh, it was known that the different protocols, uh, DNA extraction protocols actually give you a fairly different uh, profile, uh, microbiome profile. And as a result of that, um, there uh, some standardizations were, were, were made for large-scale projects such as the, the HMP or the Earth Microbiome Project. And there I listed an example from the Earth Microbiome Project, which is the same protocol used by HMP uh, for their DNA extraction. And HMP had done the study. If you go to their website, uh, there's links to studies I will show you, you know, the different uh, extraction kits, how they end up uh, giving you different sets of, of uh, organisms, uh, preferentially uh, uh, emphasis on different sets of organisms. So, uh, and as I mentioned, DNA extraction can also be done after you fractionate your samples to separate out the different organisms based on their cellular uh, size and other characteristics. Um, uh, Miguel from uh, our institute had produced a, a video uh, on this online uh, journal of, of videos, uh, highlighting some of the, the highlighting the protocols and some of the challenges associated with uh, with uh, this particular approach. Unfortunately, it's it's uh, it's not an open access site, so you might have to, you know, go through your institute to access the, the website if if it, if if your institute happens to subscribe to it, or come talk to me if you're interested in. It. Okay, so um, during the DNA extraction process, it's very common and it's almost impossible to avoid contamination from the lab. Uh, this can come from the reagents, can come from the environment in the lab, or it can come from the sequencers, you know, from the previous run that you did, and you didn't wash the sequencer properly, then uh, all these can result in contamination. In other words, DNA is out, that, that's not part of your sample, end up in your uh, sequence readout. So um, usually the level of DNA con uh, contamination is quite low compared to your sample, especially if you're extracting from uh, fecal material or, or material ha that have high yield. But if you are extracting from uh, low, yielding, uh, low yield material uh, that generates very little DNA to begin with, then uh, contamination can become a, a significant issue. Um, and in those cases, it's, it's recommended that you actually include uh, uh, extraction negative control. So run through the uh, DNA extraction process with no input. So just use the pure, uh, you know, use um, uh, molecular gray water, the best water that you can possibly get and run through the process. And you'll be surprised that you still end up with something in the negative control. Um, but then bioinformatically, we can subtract all those uh, organisms from our analysis. So it's very useful to have a, a extraction negative control in your uh, lab process uh, pipeline. Um, the other source of contamination is that contaminations are already in your sample. This includes a host or environment, uh, DNA, that come, DNA that comes from the host or comes from the, the environment. And these type of sample, this, these type of uh, contaminations in your sample are usually not e easily removed uh, in the wet lab. You can try doing subtractive hybridization, or you can try some kind of fractionation process to remove uh, some of these um, contaminants. But at the end of the day, you probably do need to rely on uh, bioinformatic uh, 
computational tools to remove these uh, sequences from your from your samples. So here I listed one that's uh, recommended by the HMP project for removing human contaminants. Uh, one thing that might be worth noting is that uh, actually I'll, I'll get to that point a bit later. Okay, so once you have your DNA, the next step is to amplify the the, the biomarkers that you're interested in. So for dark target amplification, I just wanted to highlight some terminologies on this. Uh, in this picture here, so we're all on the same page in terms of the terminology. So when I say adapter, I mean the uh, sequence that's complementary to what's on, say, the, the sequencing chip. So that's the part that hybridized to your sequencing chip. Uh, so it's called the, the, the sequence adapter. And immediate downstream of the sequence adapter is the, the primer that you use to amplify your target. So in the case here, it will be the 16S primer uh, that you use to, to amplify the V4 region of the 16S uh, ribosomal DNA. Uh, you can, uh, in between these, you can uh, introduce a unique index or unique barcode to allow you to pull, your, to, to pull multiple samples into the same run and then later on uh, using this unique barcode, then you can pull out the individual uh, samples from your pooled run. Uh, so uh, I think earlier someone mentioned about dual indexing. So in that case, the index is just present in both uh, the five prime and the three prime uh, primer sequence. Okay, so the PCR primer are designed to amplify specific regions of the genome. Uh, it's worth noting that sometimes when you get a, a dirty sample, there could be a lot of uh, amplification inhibitors in your sample. In that case, you usually need to dilute your uh, samples before you uh, can successfully amplify the target region. Um, in other more complex samples, you can actually end up with non-specific amplification. In other words, you have multiple bands uh, on your gel after you, you run your PCR amplification. Um, one way we have dealt with that issue um, is to uh, use gel size selection to only to cut out the bands out that correspond to the marker genes that we're interested in. Um, it's, uh, if you're a wet lab person, you know that's a very uh, tedious process to do by hand. So uh, we actually collaborate with a, a, a company that uh, use uh, ro that have robotics to do uh, gel ex uh, to do gel extraction. Okay. Um, so uh, again, I think Rob mentioned this earlier on, um, but the different. Uh, re so for 16S RNA, there are uh, nine hypervariable regions, and if you tar target different hyper, if, if you amplify different uh, hypervariable regions, you can actually get slightly different uh, microbial profile uh, and OTU uh, based on the region that you selected. There are a few papers, and I think I listed one of them here, but I can I certainly can send you more. Uh, about target uh, bias, uh, issues with target bias. And uh, in our uh, study, we mostly focus on the V4 region uh, using the uh, 16S, using the Illumina uh, protocol, uh, because as you might have noticed in, the, in this earlier slide, the V4 region is just the right sized, about 250 base pairs that would give you a, a decent overlap to allow you to correct for uh, sequencing errors that happen typically in the three prime end of your uh, sequences. Right. I'm sure most of you know that sequence quality degrades as you move from five prime to three prime. So the ability to correct, to have some correction in the, in the, in the three prime end is, is desirable. So, and we'll see how that can be done in the, in the lab session. Okay, so uh, even on a desktop sequencer like MySeq, 
you have uh, you have you, you generate significantly more sequences than you need for uh, to characterize a, gi a given sample. So the strategy is typically to multiple uh, to put multiple samples uh, into the sen in, into a single run. And as I mentioned already, that the way you do it is by tagging each of your samples with a unique barcode uh, that you can then later use to separate out the um, the, the reads into into the different samples. Um, the number of reads that you need to characterize a sample, of course, the different uh, really depends on on the sample itself. Uh, Rob Knight famously said it only takes about a thousand sequence to separate your elbow from your ass. So it, <laughs> when the environments are very different, hopefully, between your elbow and your ass, <laughs> you don't need a lot of reads to, to differentiate the, 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 the samples. But when the samples are much more similar, then you potentially need more reads to differentiate your samples. It's sort of the, the guiding principle. Um, when we first started metagenomic studies, we were aiming for you know ten to hundred thousand uh, reads per sample. We now realize that's probably an overkill for for several reasons. One is typically you don't need that many to differentiate uh, one sample from an, an, one type of sample from another type. And second, because a lot of the um, samples or environment are highly uneven. So you have very abundant organisms and very uh, rare organisms. If Even if you sequence to 100,000 or 10,000 reads, you're still not capturing those rare organisms. And we have done studies where we actually spike in known amount of, of DNA from a, a known organism and, and see if we can detect it in sequencing. And we realize, you know, if you speak, spike a low amount, you know it's there, but you're not going to even see it in your sequence. So for those reasons, you know, unless you have specific reasons to sequence to a high depth, it's typically advised that you sequence more samples rather than sequence to a, a much, uh, to, to a high depth for a given sample. Um, oh, and the last point is that uh, the way that these uh, parallel sequencers, so, so MySeq is an example, works is that it takes a picture of the, um, the sequencing, the, the, synth the uh, sequencing by synthesis. So it takes pictures, snapshots, of the DNA molecule as it grows. And each time it adds a, a, a new base, it emits a signal. So you can imagine if that, it, on your slide, if all the reads are uh, homogeneous are the same, then you, for each cycle of your uh, sequencing, you're going to get either a lot of spots lit up or no spot lit up. So because of that, uh, if you get, just imagine like, you know, looking at a picture, if there's all white or all black, you get very little information, right? So uh, for that reason, you usually need to, when you're only sequencing one type of ampocon, you need to spike in some additional sequences that are different from your ampocon. So phi x is a control read, uh, is the, the default uh, that people spike into their Illumina runs uh, in order to sort of make the, the sample more, he the more heterogeneous to allow better resolution. So you might think that if I don't spike in any uh, other sequences, I get more reads, but it's actually counterproductive because your quality of your uh, readout will be much lower than if you spike in a, a, a different sequence. So hopefully that's clear. Okay, so the last uh, point that I want to carry is that you can actually do one step versus two step uh, PCR amplification. And uh, the Protocol that's described by, by Rob Knight's group um, uses the one-step implication, and as shown in the, um, the diagram earlier, you can see the adapter, the barcode, and the primers are all in one construct, and, um, and you only need to do one PCR uh, step to amplify the target genes and to have the sequencing adapters already on your molecule ready for, for sequencing. 
Um, that type of approach is great in the sense that it's much quicker protocol, uh, but it's not uh, suitable if you have degraded, uh, sorry, degenerate primer that you're using, or if um, you're trying to amplify uh, many different types of amplicons, because these long uh, primers typically can, the, the adapter and the, and the barcodes can actually interfere with the, the uh, PCR, uh, the, the target primers that you're using. So you, if you do the one-step application, you actually have to test out each of your uh, long primers in order to, to make sure that they, they do amplify your target properly and there's no marked um, bias due to the, the presence of a barcode. For 16S, it has been tested uh, quite nicely, but for other markers, uh, there's very little uh, existing one-step uh, one-step primers available for amplification. Um, so, for that reason, when we did our study where we have multiple target sites that we're trying to amplify, we end up using a two-step process, which uh, we use the, the published. Uh, target primer, so we'll test the target primer to amplify the target, and then we then ligate the, the adapter and the barcodes to the, the amplicons uh, after the, the PCR step. Uh, this approach is, is um, you do lose uh, biomaterial using this approach because, um, you know, the, the ligation is, is certainly not 100% efficient, uh, but it is compatible with Rendon and, and the Generate primer uh, amplification steps. And this approach uh, is s supported by most of the, the uh, primer vendors such as Illumina. We use a company called BioO before. New England BioLab also have a set of primers that you can use for, for these type of approach. Okay, so moving into the more uh, bioinformatic analysis component going to introduce you to two different uh, tools. Uh, one is CHIME uh, and the other is called MOTHER. Um, so CHIME stands for Quantitative Insight into Microbial Ecology. It only takes geniuses like Rob Nice to come up with these hard to read acronyms that actually mean something. Um, MOTHER on the other hand doesn't stand as far as I know for any acronyms but uh, the developer um, Patrick uh, Pat uh, Schlau uh, had a series of tools, names, uh, son, daughter, and others. So I guess the next logical step is the, for his naming scheme is his mother. Uh, so that's, that's where the name mother came from. Okay. Uh, so these two tools started off from very different uh, uh, emphasis um, one um, they, they but, but but over time they sort of, so initially they have very different functions and you kind of have to pick one or the other when you need to do certain type of analysis but over time they they start to converge and nowadays you can pretty much use either one to to accomplish your analysis there, uh, there are some subtle differences uh, both in sort of philosoph uh, in the philosophy of their design, but also in some sort of practical um, advices. So uh, Chime is actually a Python interface that uh, glued together many different programs. Uh, and Mother, on the other hand, is a single program with minimal external dependency. So because of that, um, it's much easier to install and set up Mother, and it's much easier to learn how to use Mother. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Chime is, uh, has a large number of dependencies. It's, it could easily take you a day or two just to install all the dependencies required for Chime. But they do make a virtual machine available that you can download and launch on your own computer. The downside of a virtual machine, of course, is quite limited by the number of, uh, 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 quite limited by the, the size of your machine. So if you load it on your laptop, then it's, it's not a very powerful machine to do analysis. And if you and very rarely can you actually deploy it on a on a on a server or a powerful machine. Um, so um, the other um, 
Did I miss anything? Yeah, so the other point is that because Chime is actually a, a glue that brings together many different programs, um, it's more scalable in the sense that you can use different programs for different um, purposes, and some of the programs are highly parallelizable. Mother, on the other hand, is best suited to run on a single machine. And for some of the analysis, that machine hopefully is, is as, as powerful as you can, can get. We have run into situations we, where we have these servers with um, you know, 32 CPUs and, or 32 cores and one terabyte of memory, and we still run into trouble when, when running Mother on a large uh, data set. And that's because some of the steps that it uh, requires loading the entire data set into the memory, and, um, and it's very uh, resource in, in intensive. Uh, since, uh, I mean, it has since come up with better ways to break down the, the, the large data sets into smaller ones, but still, um, it's not, uh, it's not as scalable as, as Chime. Um, I'm going to highlight two links here. One is a publication put out by the Chime group, sort of telling, uh, giving you a, a walkthrough of, of how to use Chime. And a lot of my, actually, uh, material that I'm showing here came directly from this uh, paper. Uh, the other one to highlight is the, the MySeq SOP from the Mother um, website. And again, a, a lot of my tutorial is coming uh, from this uh, material here. And it's well worth your time if you want to do biomarker analysis to, to be familiar with both of these resources. Okay, so here's an overview of the, the bioinformatic workflow. Uh, I'll go through these steps uh, individually, but just to show you that uh, you typically start off with your sequence data as, as input, and with that sequence data, you will have some uh, additional information about your, your samples. So that, those are the, the metadata. So the sequence data need to be processed in order to uh, be ready for, for, um, for OTU picking, for, for clustering. And once you have to pick the OT, once you have picked the OTUs, you can either uh, directly uh, assign the, the OTUs to different taxa, or you can do an alignment. And from this aligned sequence, then you can do a phylogenetic analysis, which will give you a phylogenetic tree. Uh, when you do uh, taxonomic assignment, what you end up is a, an OTU table, so a list of uh, OTUs. Uh, and which OTUs uh, in, in which sample. And from the OTU table or the phylogenetic tree, then you can perform downstream analysis, uh, looking at the diversity of your samples or to visualize the, the, um, the composition of your, of your samples. Okay, so we, what we'll do is, uh, uh, my slides will refer to these numbers uh, here as we go through them so you can sort of flip back and forth just to know which uh, stage we're at for the, the analysis. And I did the same for the lab as well, so you can refer back to this diagram to see which stage of the analysis you are in uh, when doing the lab. Okay, so uh, I mentioned contamination already, and uh, I also mentioned that the com the contam the contam Contamination, um, when you do the con decontamination in a, in a bioinformatic analysis, this typically involves mapping your reads to a database containing the suspected contamination. So if you want to remove the human sequences, you will search against the human genome database. If you want to remove, um, say, um, mouse or, or rat, you'll search against their respective genomes. Uh, one, um, oh, so typically this type of search is you're getting millions of sequences. If you use blast search, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, uh, it's a fairly slow uh, algorithm, so it could take days just to search through your, your data set. So typically what we do is use a shore realigner um, to do this type of search. Um, I... Um, won't go into this at, at this point, but the uh, 
the HMP uh, decontamination protocol would give you a sense of how that, that can be done. And if you want more information, I'd be happy to talk to you more about, you know, the shore realigners and what they are. Um, what we, in, in our own analysis, however, we found that most of the shore realigners give you comparable results. So it really doesn't matter which one you pick to use. What does make a difference is that if your database can have the, it can include the host variant. So as you know, the, the human genome, when it's sequenced, it's a, it's a composite. Uh, it's a composite of multiple genomes, and then later on, they add the the different variants uh, to the to um, to the database, and you can choose to download just the core genome with uh, or download also a list of variants. And what we found is, that if you include the host variant, uh, in other words, SNP or whatever type of variants that's available uh, in your search, it will help to improve the matching and therefore remove more host. Uh, Sequences from your um, from your uh, from your from your sequences for for uh, downstream analysis. Any questions so far? Any mistakes? Sorry, I have a question. Sure. <laughs> Okay. What's the identity threshold that you find? Uh, so most of the shore realigners actually have fairly stringent threshold. Typically, it's about two per two three percent. Could probably go up to about five percent, but anything above that, then it's much less efficient at uh, at uh, matching. So you usually do two to three percent as a cutoff. But that's why I said to include the variants because some of the very some of the more variable regions could easily. Uh, Exceed the two two percent threshold. Are there any like uh, publicly available databases for contamination of confounding reagents or something similar? Uh, yeah. So Nick Lohman, uh, and so you just Google Nick Lohman, or he's on Twitter, like no one's business. Uh, so if if you want to find him on Twitter or we'll find him on, on on Google, you can. Uh, he did. He, he and others. Uh, have published a paper looking at common contaminants found in reagents. And I don't know if there's a specific database associated with what they found, but certainly you can pull out the organisms uh, from NCBI that correspond to, to what they found to be in those reagents. Yeah. If you're not doing the novel uh, picking, um, do you still need to do the, the contamination? Uh, less so, yeah. You can probably get away without doing if you if you're not doing the novel OTU picking, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, yeah, you can probably skip this step. And certainly, for empicon based analysis, this is less critical because your 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 PC amplification hopefully is specific enough. You have very few contaminants to begin with. It's more of an issue for sure for metagenomics analysis. Any other questions? Okay, so um, I think I covered this already, but basically uh, the first step of, of pre-processing is to remove the barcodes and the, the PCR primers. Those are artifacts of your amplification, so you need to remove those from your actual uh, amplicons before, uh, before your analysis. Um, the step is fairly well worked out, so I'm, I'm not going to drill too, uh, on it too much. But um, but if you again any questions, feel free to to uh, talk to me. Okay. So uh, the next step is that uh, once you remove the the obvious uh, adapter and, and primer sequences, uh, there you leave with hopefully what hopefully what you're tr truly trying to amplify. But some of these amplicons will have low quality. So the next step is to remove uh, reads that have low quality. Uh, both Chime and Mother have fairly good uh, protocol worked out for removing low quality uh, sequences. And some of the common parameters used are uh, minimum lengths of consecutive high quality base. In other words, after you cut out the low quality region, how much 
of your original input count is left. If it's shorter than a certain, fra a certain proportion of your original input count, then it might be discarded entirely rather than trying to keep a short so input count. So child is built for 454. Before this step, if you do pair in, you know, how you concatenate that one? There, you know, I have a difficulty to concatenate to mimic 454 lengths before the, you know, before feeding to the child. Uh, Sorry, yeah, so the, I guess the question is, if you have 454 data, how do you... That, that, five, child is designed for 545, 454. Four, four. Okay, so if so, you have Illumina data... Yes, okay, my gotcha. paired in read, right. we have to mimic the 454 to feed to China. Right, so yeah. uh, in that case, I actually would recommend using Mother. Uh, as you will see, Mother has the, the MySeq SOP that's designed to remove, uh, to, uh, to do the filtering and do the, um, the, the assembly for you. Uh, so I'll show that in a bit. But if you want to use Chime, I'm pretty sure Chime now has uh, Illumina um, Based protocol to allow you to remove, uh, to allow you to merge your uh, sequences. And actually, in our lab, I'll show you one of the tools that can be fit into Chime to do that. Um, but both Chime and Mother were developed when 454 was the the platform of choice. So both of them have since adopted to to Illumina uh, for sure. Okay, so uh, besides the, uh, the length of the read, you will also uh, look for maximum number of low quality bases. So if you have a long stretch of low quality bases, that's an another sign that the entire read might not be very good. Uh, the next is the number of ambiguous bases, again, an indication of a low quality. And you can also set a, a, low, a quality threshold to, uh, to scan through your entire sequence. And if there's Again, regions that are low quality, you can discard the entire sequence. Um, here I'm just listing some of the tools that can be used. So both, as I say, Mother and Chime have built-in filters that you can use, but there are other tools that you can use independently outside of these tools to do quality uh, filtering and, and to do uh, pair-end assembly. And I'll show some of that uh, later. And FastQC, is a, a tool that's very popular for um, summarizing your quality, uh, sequence quality. So you, all you have to do is feed it uh, a FASTQ file and it will give you a summary report of what, uh, how, how good your sequence quality is. Okay, moving on to uh, OTU picking. Okay, so OTUs are uh, essentially arbitrarily uh, formed clusters uh, based on sequence identity. The 97% sequence similarity is uh, the default cutoff for most of the programs, and that roughly corresponds to the species level. Although uh, I'll show later, there's publications indicating that the 97%, uh, it's really just a very rough guideline, and you really should be. Um, tailoring the threshold based on the, the organism that you're interested in, in targeting. Um, so I'll highlight three different approaches, de novo clustering, uh, close reference, and open reference. And there's more detail about OTU picking at this uh, link here. Okay, so I'll start with de novo clustering. This is sort of conceptually probably the most straightforward to understand. Essentially, you have a group of sequences that you want to uh, cluster based on their sequence identity. So what you start with is just pairwise comparison of all your sequences to establish how uh, similar each pair is. And then you can use hierarchical clustering, basically starting from the most similar pairs of sequences and build up uh, your uh, clustering that way. And then you, let's say, have a 97% uh, cutoff, that means once you build your hierarchical clustering, any sequences that are uh, beyond the, beyond your uh, that falls outside of your your similarity cutoff uh, forms its own 
a cluster. So you end up with multiple clusters, each roughly about 97, uh, each roughly about 3% different. So uh, this process requires a lot of memory. As, as you can imagine, if you have a tenth, uh, let's say a thousand sequence, that's a thousand times a thousand pairs of, of comparison that you need to do. So if you have a million, that's a million times a million, which is, I don't even know what that, one, uh, I think it's 100 billion or so, or one trillion, that sequences, are, uh, uh, pairs of sequences that you're comparing. So that could easily overwhelm even the largest uh, machine that you have, and this is typically the step where we run out of uh, memory on our uh, computers. Um, so here's a, a, a um, so besides hierarchical clustering, there's a, a faster algorithm developed uh, by uh, called uclost, or later on, it's also part of the the u search uh, tool. That we'll, we'll uh, show in in the class uh, in the in the lab later. Um, so this type of approach, instead of doing pairwise comparison, what it does is to try to find the centroid for your uh, sequence. So then, instead of doing pairwise comparison, everything that falls within a certain distance from the centroid are uh, grouped into the same cluster. So so that, for example, is an OTU represented by this particular sequence in the middle. Um, so that's what we call the, the representative sequence. And all these are um, the uh, equivalent sequences for that OTU. So for when you call an OTU, you have to keep in mind that uh, what you're essentially saying is that every sequence is that fall within the OTU, you're going to treat it the same. Uh, for as far as your downstream analysis is concerned. So that's why picking the threshold is quite important because you don't want to lump together sequences that shouldn't be treated as the same um, organ, that they shouldn't be treated as the same organism or the same taxon. How is the centroid sequence chosen? Uh, in this case, it's oh, so how is centroid ch chosen? In this case, it's typically you rank your sequence from the most abundant to the least abundant. And then you pick your centroid by picking the longest sequences. And you just go from top to bottom and, and essentially take the, uh, the, the most abundant sequence, scan through your uh, rest of your sequence to see which one falls 97% uh, from, the, from, the, uh, from the sequence you pick. And everything, that's why it's called greedy, because depending on which one you choose as your first, it, if, it affects uh, your down your uh, your OTU clustering, um, and there diff there's different pr uh, protocols. I'm just describing the most sort of common way of, of doing it. But different tweaks and different protocols can actually improve your OTU picking. Is there any room to pick up the T value or the threshold value? Yes, yeah, so that's why you define as a user definable. So the T the threshold value is defined by you. Is that so? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, very tricky here because you will need to put something that's not Right. So, are you saying is there rules uh, yeah, for? Rule, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes and no. I mean, the the ninety seven percent is the rule of thumb people use for um, species level comparison and tools like uh, you uh, you search actually recommend you don't go below ninety seven percent because if you go below ninety seven percent, the um, the algorithm becomes unreliable. I mean, we can talk more about why it becomes unreliable, but 97% is the short answer. Is it, is it possible to differentiate a species level? I think it gives you a genus level, right? Uh, typically, 97 people say species, but, uh, but we, in reality, that range is actually from anywhere between 90 to 99%. So, so it, it's really all over the place. And I have some stats for you later on. Um, the other point that I should mention is that if you look at this diagram, let's say the T is three here, that means 3% uh, is the minimum distance uh, between your two sequences. In other words, if you, if you look at this sequence here and this sequence there, obviously that's not 3%, right? That's more like 6%. So, so when you pick 97%, what end up in your OTU could actually 
be as little as 94, 93%. Um, so that's something to be careful about. And another way to get around this issue is that you do the, the OTU uh, clustering twice. You first cluster at high stringency, 99, 98%, and then you cluster again at the lower stringency. That helped to cut out some of the, the issues associated with uh, just using a very relaxed uh, threshold to begin with. Okay. Um, okay, so moving on to close reference. Uh, this one uh, simply means you take your sequences and you match to an existing database of reference sequences. So it's shown in the picture here, essentially, your list of sequences is compared to an existing database. And any, anything that hit the database that, that has a match in the database is kept in your OTU uh, table. And what's uh, not matched in, to the database is simply discarded. So this type of approach is fast and it could be parallelized because you know the, the matching could be done independently. You can take the first 10 to do the matching and then the next 10 on a, you, on a different machine and you can submit the next 10 to a different machine to do the matching. So you can then afterwards combine the results. Since the matching is just between your query sequence and the database, it really doesn't um, it, the, the, the other sequences in your data set has no, no bearing, no influence on what the matching, uh, whether it will match or, or not match, right? That makes sense. Whereas this particular approach, you can parallelize it easily because the, the algorithm has to scan the entire uh, queries, your entire queries, uh, your entire input data set to establish the, the clusters. So that's why this close reference is much faster um, and it's suitable if you have a comprehensive and, and, and properly annotated database, such as the 16S database, but it certainly doesn't work very well if your reference database is poorly annotated or is very sparse. So you're going to get a lot of sequences with no hits to your database. In, in those cases, you're much better off using either de novo or open reference, uh, which we'll see next. So open reference, simply put, is just a combination of close reference uh, search followed by processing the dismissed sequences using de novo uh, clustering. So you simply take the rest of the sequence that don't match to your database and do de novo clustering. Then at the end, you merge the two OTU tables. There's different ways of implementing this particular approach. Uh, suffice to say, this is the choice that if you have the time or and want the most robust data set, this is the, the approach to use. Okay, um, and I already mentioned the representative sequence is typically the centroid of your OTU. And th there are several ways of picking that centroid. One is based on abundance. Uh, so most abundance sequences are likely to be most relevant for your analysis. And uh, the other way is just use a centroid that's used for the de novo uh, OTU picking. You can also pick the longest sequence available for from your set of, of OT, uh, sequence in a given OTU, pick the longest one. Is that likely to be the representative? The caveat for that, of course, is that if your longest one happened to be a chimera or some sort of hybrid sequence that's not real, then then that could be an issue uh, if you just pick simply by length. Um, uh, basically, if, you're, if you know your input count is 250 base pair long, then, any, then you shouldn't be picking a uh, representative, representative sequence that's 500 base pairs long. Um, and there's few others that are uh, less, um, less uh, often used. So most common is just the most abundant sequence is used as a, as a representative sequence. Okay, so as I mentioned, do, uh, during your PCR amplification process, you can actually end up with a chimeric sequence that's an artificially joined sequence from more than one template. So for example, in this case here, uh, you have two template and it gives you a chimeric sequence that's partly from this sequence X and second 
part from uh, sequence Y. So uh, we'll see how uh, some we'll see some of the tools that can be used to remove chimeric sequence. And typically, the detection is based on identification of a three-way alignment. So you know this sequence, this part aligned to X, this part aligned to Y. That's a good indication of chimeric sequence. All right, moving on to taxonomy assignment. Um, it's important to, to differentiate OTUs from uh, taxon. So OTUs don't have names, uh, but we as humans often like to give a name to an entity, right? So uh, instead of referring things as OTU1 or OTU2, it's usually much more meaningful for us to refer to something as E. coli or salmonella or bacteroid DDs and so on. So, um, so as, a, as a result of that, uh, most of the time we end up assigning OTUs to known taxon in an attempt to, to, make, to make sense of the data. Uh, but bear in mind that the OTU or the sequences is not exactly the same as the taxon. There's just it, and, and there's the issue of resolution. So imagine you, um, what's a good example? So imagine you have different, um, you know, um, different animals uh, that you can call it animal A, animal B, and so on. But if you, once you assign it a given name, let's say elephant, we know what you, you know, we commonly know what you're referring to as an elephant, but there are always things that look like mammoth, for example, that look kind of like an elephant. So would you classify that as part of, would you call it elephant or would you call it something else? So the name, what I'm trying to get at is the name and the actual entity are not exactly equivalent. So you keep that in mind, it would help you to understand um, the difference between an OTU analysis and a taxonomic analysis. And the, the process of assigning an OTU to a, a taxon is simply by similarity search. So we match, we map an OTU to a known taxon based on similarity. And again, the cutoff of what you use can affect your, your interpretation of the results. Okay, so tax. Uh, most of your, said I get most of your... So, oh. as far as I understand, open reference plus the noble clustering, first yeah. you remove everything which is known by referencing it to a data set, right? Yeah. So, and then the rest that was not assigned will be the noble or something. Mm -hmm. But the resulting of the use from the, the noble clustering, wouldn't they have been assigned before that already, if they were known or close to the reference? Right, so so that's where you know understanding the difference between the OTU and taxon is is the key. You can do OTU clustering at a given cutoff, and then do the taxonomic mapping at a different cutoff. So often an OTU that's not assigned right away could still be forced into a taxon based on the cutoff you're using. So so that's the sort of the key message here is that. The two are not exactly the same, and, and important to keep that in, in mind. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, in the case where the OTU really cannot be assigned to a known taxon, then you keep the, the OTU uh, designation. There's nothing, not much you can do. You, you just call it OTU X and move on with your analysis. Yeah. While we're on the topic of OTU picking, just for the close reference of OTU picking, just any clarification on allowed taxonomic Right, so once you assign things to taxon, let's say you use uh, CPN60 to define in your uh, taxonomic mapping, say to E. coli, and then you use uh, 16S also to assign uh, to to differentiate your sequences and assign things to E. coli. 
then at the taxonomic level, you then can treat those as equivalent. Whether that's ideal or not, it, it's probably not, but it's it's po it's possible to do do that. So once you assign things to taxon taxonomy, again, you're treating everything within the taxon within the taxon the same, right? So uh, so then you can do comparison that way. Um, it for that will probably not be your primary comparison, but it will probably form a meta comparison. So when you trying to compare across different environments, then you can use the different markers, and hopefully they give you um, uh, complementary signals that will allow you to, to um, characterize your environment better than just a single marker. And that's sort of the approach we took for the watershed project. And so just saying we look at 16S, we look at a whole bunch of biomarkers, and we're trying to compare and contrast what the different biomarkers report as the, the important organisms. And actually, in a lot of cases, we identify the same important uh, organisms or species uh, using different markers. Yeah. But the key is you have to assign it to a taxon in order to do that comparison. Uh, okay. So here, just to sh show quickly that you have a set of OTUs, and it's the unique, it, the matching algorithm or the mapping algorithm is important. As I mentioned, OTU and taxon taxon are different things. So when you report out your analysis, you actually have to report the matching algorithm you use to go from OTU to the specific taxonomy. Uh, um, assignments that, that you give. So, and, the, and also the different taxonomy databases could give you different results as we'll see in the lab section. So, um, yeah, so just keep that in mind. Uh, I think Rob mentioned the different databases already, so I'll skip over that. Which, oh. which of those databases is commonly used? Which one? Well, so as I mentioned here, uh, green genes is preferred by Chime and Silva is preferred by Mother. The key difference is green gene is a much shorter alignment and Silva is a much longer alignment. So your 16S genes are the same size, right? But the different alignment method creates templates that are short or long. And the argument made by uh, patch laws is that the longer alignment actually is more accurate alignment than the shorter alignment which forces space to align when they shouldn't shouldn't align. So so if you believe pad you use Selva. If you believe uh, the chime group then you, you you can use green gene. And that basis updated Yeah every six months or so. So the database is updated every six months or so. Yeah. Or or RDP is actually a little bit more frequent than that. Because essentially, it's an automated pipeline that pulls sequences from NCBI and convert it to their own taxonomy. Uh, okay, I'm getting to the end. So bear with me for another 10 minutes or so. Okay, so the one caveat I want to mention, and this came up a few times already, only 11% of the 150 or so human-associated bacteria genera have species that fall within the 95 to 99 percent 16 sRNA identity cutoff. So the 97 percent cutoff that we typically use only really apply for about 10, 11 percent of the, the human-associated uh, genera. So that really gives you a sense that the 97 percent is really just a rule of thumb, and if possible, you really would want to explore what the diversity within your species of interest is before deciding what the cutoff to use is. Okay, so once you do the taxonomy assignment, you typically get a bar graph that just shows you the proportion of each uh, taxon in your sample. So I'm sure that's uh, self, pretty self-explanatory, but we'll see some of that in the lab. All right, so next few steps fairly quickly. So, um, OTU tables is actually just a, a sample by observation matrix. So you have the OTUs in one x axis, the samples on the other axis, and you just list the number of occurrence for each OTU in a given sample. 
So that's that's essentially what an OTU table is. Um, the OTU table then can be mapped to taxonomy information. So you can have a separate file that says OTU1, or, or it could be in the same file, but anyway. So you could have a, another a bit, bit of information that says OTU1 is, say, uh, bacteroides uh, or, or some other organism, and so on. So um, the typically pipe, uh, the pipelines I will see, the, the extreme rare OTUs have uh, removed uh, a filter out, uh, and often these are attributed to sequencing errors, and and they're just removed to to facilitate downstream analysis. And this sort of echoes my point earlier that these really rare sequences, no matter how deep you sequence, you're often not going to catch them. So there's really not a whole lot of point sequencing a sample to a to a huge depth unless you know for sure you're trying to capture some rare um, OTUs or rare organisms. Okay, uh, and o this OTU table can be converted to this common biome format. Uh, it's actually a binary format, so um, so again, it speed up the analysis by compressing the OTU information into a biome file. Okay, so sequence alignment, um, we, I think most of you here are familiar with sequence alignment, um, but it is a required step before you can do distance-based analysis, or for example, a phylogeny uh, tree, phylogenetic tree, or phylogeny analysis. Um, the traditional alignment programs that you might be familiar with, such as cluster W, muscle, and so on, are way too slow to align, to do multiple alignments of thousands, if not tens of thousands or millions of sequences. So new type of method have been developed, such as uh, PyNAST, which we'll look at later on, and Inferno. These are called template-based uh, aligners. Essentially what you do is, uh, you can almost think of it as, as flash search. You, you search against a pre-aligned data set to establish the closest relative to your query sequence. Once that's found, then instead of aligning your sequence against thousands of sequences in the database or, or in your own data or, or in your own data set, you're not only align your sequence to a handful of what's called templates in your uh, that are pulled out from the database based on similarity. So in other words, it cuts down the number of sequences you have to feed into an, an alignment process. So dramatically speed up the, the alignment process. Okay, so once you have the alignment, you can use any of the phylogenetic analysis programs that you might be familiar with. The exception is when your data set is really large, then you might need to use programs such as FastTree, which is a, a fax approximation a, a, a likelihood-based algorithm that's a fact approximation of maximum likelihood to uh, to build your your phylogenetic tree. Okay, so I mentioned that we usually pull samples into the same run. As a result of that, it's very hard to have an uh, even number of, of reads from each sample. So the the um, uh, but then the sampling depth can actually affect your richness and diversity calculation. So the, the common current practice now is to essentially do rare, uh, essentially verify your samples to the low uh, to the lowest or to an acceptable number of reads uh, in your sample. So if you're you have ten samples, the lowest uh, read for a given sample is a thousand, and the highest is ten thousand then you're actually losing 9,000 9, sequences by verifying um, to the lowest common, uh, the, num uh, the lowest common, uh, uh, the, the lowest uh, number of reads for, the, for a sample. Uh, it's been shown that this type of approach, at least statistically speaking, is not very sound because you're not only losing a lot of your reads, the diversity um, information you're you get from the artificial truncation of your uh, read depth, it's actually uh, uh, it actually affected the downstream analysis as well. So the 
the new approach that people are recommending is covariant stabilizing transformation. Essentially, control the if you have higher depths uh, in your sampling, usually that results in a higher variance. So by controlling the variance in your samples, that's a one way of squishing down your high depth reads to a, a more to a more manageable, um, I should say, more comparable uh, um, value as the rest of your samples. So there are a couple of references there that you can uh, look into for that type of approaches. Um, okay, so quickly, uh, Rob already talked about alpha diversity, so and, and richness is just the number of species observed or estimated in your sample. Evenness is the relative abundance of each sample. Diversity takes both evenness and richness into account and Suffice to say, there are a lot of different diversity measures, uh, both implemented in Chime and Mother. And um, as to which one to choose, I don't know if anyone has really a good explanation, but the rule of thumb is typically you try the few popular ones, and hopefully they all give you the same stories and not uh, contradicting each other. Um, this is sort of a, a rarefaction plot showing when you have close reference. It's hard to read here. You, your OTU count is much lower, around 20, compared to when you have open reference with de novo. With the same sample, OTU count is much higher when you have de novo or open reference. Um, and the rare, rare fraction curve essentially plots uh, the estimate number of OTUs at a, current, at, at a given sequencing depth. So as your sequencing depth goes up, you would expect that the curve uh, would go up as well. And what you're hoping to see is that the curve essentially uh, evens out or plateaus out. That means you reach uh, the saturation of your uh, diversity. Okay, uh, beta diversity is comparison across samples or across environments. And again, multiple different measure, uh, measures for those. Uh, the key differences is probably ones that measure the membership of your um, samples, so looking at OTU abundant, uh, looking at the OTU presence or absence only, versus ones that look at the structure of your uh, community, so that look at the relative abundance of OTUs, and these are some of the common measures used. Okay, so for beta diversity analysis, you first need to do pairwise comparison across your samples and establish a distance matrix. Uh, for all your samples. So the distance, of course, will be, uh, the similarity will be the highest, say one, between your samples, or the distance will be zero. It's typically a score between zero and one. Um, so here I'm showing the similarity. So one, sample one against itself has the highest similarity. Sample two against sample one has lower similarity, and so on and so forth. So by establishing a matrix like this, then you can transform it to uh, uh, PCOA plot or other types of plot to look at the relationship of your uh, of your samples. Okay, so Unifrac is one of the popular beta diversity measures. Um, the way it works essentially, you map all your OTUs to a phylogenetic to the same phylogenetic tree, and um, you sum up the branch lengths that are unique to each sample. So for example, in this case, the purple one shows the, um, the branches are unique to the red samples versus the green samples. And when you have a very different community, then the, um, you'll see a much longer unique branch. So the, the, the larger the unique fraud score, the, the, more, that, the more different the uh, communities are against each other. The two versions, weighted versus unweighted, again, correspond to, so the weighted one correspond to the abundance measure, and the unweighted one correspond to the presence or absence of OTUs. OK, so the, w the way I like to describe these principal coordinate or component analyses, uh, and Rob sort of put me on spot to try to explain it. I had to ask him what the, huge, uh, what the differences are. And uh, I'll get into that a little bit. But conceptually, what we want to do is that when you have a multi, 
um, variable high dimension uh, sample, it's very hard to visualize that uh, on a graph. We're much more familiar with two-dimensional visualization or three-dimensional visualization. So in order to view multidimensional data, uh, the distance would be um, the distance in terms of the PCOA uh, principal coordinate analysis or the, uh, the um, covariance in terms of the, the principal component analysis, essentially it's projected into a lower dimension. And the most common, of course, is two or three dimensions, so you can actually view it in a, in a graph. I don't know if anyone has tried to plot four-dimensional graphs, but if you figure out how to do that, um, <coughs> let me know. Probably some sort of time series analysis. But. But anyway, anything five dimension, I don't think it's it's imaginable. But just imagine you have three D three D object. Uh, you want to project it such that you can still tell the salient feature of that object, right? So this is a chair. If you project it this way, you can still tell it's a chair. But imagine if you project it this way. Now all of a sudden, that could be a, a ladder or could be something else, right? That gives much less information than this particular projection. So the goal of uh, uh, these projection is to maximize the the, the uh, to maximize the, the variations or the, the salient features that can explain your data set uh, in the lower dimension. So clear? Okay. So uh, okay. So here is a plot of uh, principal coordinate analysis. So essentially a two-dimensional plot showing you that these samples are different from these set of samples So in the first dimension. And in the second dimension, further separate out the blue ones from the yellow yellow ones. So that's how you would read the PCO, uh, principal coordinate plot, uh, basically dimension by dimension. All right. Uh, hierarchical clustering can also be done on the same data set. Sorry, yeah. The biggest difference between PCOA and PCA? The biggest difference, well, so PCA or, or P, uh, the PCA essentially it's is um, well. Let me say the uh, the um, the coordinate analysis. So when you have distance information. Um, you need to project that onto a fixed coordinate uh, in order to interpret the end result. So what? So the difference between PCA and PCOA is that when you have distance information, that need to be projected into a fixed coordinate. Then from there, you can you do the same PCA analysis, principal coordinate analysis. Try to identify the covariance in your in your data and max and project it such way, such that the maximum variance is is the most salient features is, is shown in your graph. So that's sort of the... So P, PCOA essentially is projection into a, a dis, a, a, of your distance matrix into a fixed coordinate, then from there, a principal component analysis. And a principal con a, a component analysis, I don't know if anyone have a better explanation of, of what that is, but it's it's a decomposition of your uh, covariance in your data with, with the basic idea of trying to maximize the, the um, features that separate out your data sets the best. So does a PCOA lead to the identification of the principal components? Is yes. Yeah. Eventually, yeah. One more time, can you repeat that? Oh, the the PCOA is distant, uh, projecting the distance into a fixed coordinate, then, then you do principal component analysis. So you still end up with the, the, you know, the, com the components of your, um, uh, of your vector, you know, your vectors. Uh, okay, so hierarchical clustering, um, you can apply this. You can use the same. You can input the same data set and get hierarchical clustering. The key difference here is that now your samples are forced into bifurcation trees, and a lot of time the samples are not related in a bifurcating manner, right? So, the clustering approach look a lot more natural than the bifurcating method. You can still see the yellow ones and the blue ones sort of separate out in the tree, but 
as a human, we tend to overinterpret the uh, the, uh, the relationship in a in a bifurcating tree. So, I think fewer people are using high echo clustering to show show the um, show the uh, the uh, coronation results. Okay. Uh, Okay, so marker gene versus shotgun sequencing. As I mentioned, uh, um, Morgan will talk more about the shotgun metagenomics tomorrow. But suffice to say, marker gene is still cheaper, computationally less uh, demanding. Uh, it provides taxonomic profiling rather than both taxonomy and functional profiling. And you need software such as uh, PyCross to map the uh, taxonomy to predict functions, which you'll see uh, tomorrow. Um, the 16S genes, if you use 16S, majority of genes can be assigned, whereas you will end up with a lot of unassigned gene fragments when you do shotgun uh, metagenomics. And again, contamination more issue in shotgun than marker gene based. Uh, what's worth noting is that um, when you look at the function, uh, sorry, the taxonomic classification, uh, the samples can look quite different. But when you look at the functional at the functional level, the same samples now look much more even. So this is to say that uh, one way to interpret it is that the different bacterial uh, different bacteria actually encode similar functions and fill in similar niche. Um, so sometimes it it's advantageous to look at the functions because you probably get a more consistent output than to look uh, in certain a more consistent pattern than looking at the taxa alone. Uh, Morgan will cover pi cross tomorrow, so I'll skip that. And okay, so we'll take a quick break and then move into the lab. Any questions? When you look at the taxonomic assignments, okay. uh, does, it, does it account for the uh, copy numbers of the 16S gene? Yes. Uh, you mean within the genome? No, it doesn't. So if, if you have seven times the 16S, you're going to have seven times more of this bacteria than in reality. Right. So you need you can correct for that if if you wish. Yeah. 